So we're going to talk about virtual memory today. This is one of the important topics that sits at the interface between computer architecture and operating systems, which um, we'll talk about the relationship probably near the end of this chat. We're going to talk about really all three of these, these components of the storage portion of a computer and how they relate to the notion of virtual memory. So let's get to it. Virtual memory is how we bridge the gap in our storage hierarchy between main memory, what we think of as physical memory. Typically, that's your DRAM, DDR chips, so the physical memory. And secondary memory, sometimes called secondary storage or storage, historically has been spinning disks, uh, so hard disks, drives with spinning platters. And nowadays, you may also have solid state drives. We can extend this storage hierarchy even further in uh, distributed systems, but we're, we're not going to push that far in this class. The problem to overcome is that there's only one physical memory, but multiple applications want to use that physical memory more or less simultaneously. Historically, really concurrently, right? Swapping out, interleaving when they're using the physical memory but they would like to have their code and data, their program, resident in physical memory when they're ready to execute. Ability to share the physical resource among multiple competing consumers is the basic problem here. Applications, they don't want to share the data. They just want to, but they, but they overlap in terms of the the way that they access the memory. So the physical addresses, physical address space is the same for all the programs that execute on a computer. And so they, they share physical addresses, but they don't want to actually share their data with each other because one application should not be able to accidentally or maliciously modify the data of another application. So we don't want to accidentally share data. Sometimes we'll purposely share data and we'll talk about how that's. The solution to this is virtual memory or a virtual address space. The idea is that we use disks as the backing store for physical memory. And then the physical main memory becomes a cache of secondary memory. Um, so virtual memory is really a generalization in some sense of this cache concept to physical memory. Programs and therefore processors use virtual memory addresses and the hardware is responsible for converting virtual memory addresses into something that the physical memory can use and understands. And we're going to talk about how that happens today as well. The sharing of the physical resource is done by partitioning and allocating subsets of the partitions of physical memory to the individual virtual memory address spaces. The virtual address spaces can be different sized than physical memory. They can be smaller, they can be larger. When a virtual address space uses more memory than is available in the physical memory, then the excess portions are on secondary storage. Just like when you have a cache whose capacity can't hold the working set of data that a program uses, the excess goes into physical memory. By the same token, if the physical memory can't hold the amount of data that an application's virtual address space uses, then the excess is on secondary storage. If secondary storage runs out, then the application dies. Typically not common. Virtual memory uh, allows us to safely share the physical resource of main memory among multiple executing programs. Remember, a program and execution is called a process. So I may go back and forth between calling them executing programs or processes. The virtual memory allows a program to be different size than physical memory. Historically, this was actually the reason that virtual memory was created, was to solve a compatibility problem across different computers that had differing physical memory sizes. You wanted to be able to take a program from one computer to a different computer, which had the same processor, but different physical memory, and have it work still. And virtual memory was also a solution to that problem. So that's really actually where 
virtual memory started and it evolved over time. I'm going to skip the evolution of the mechanisms of virtual memory and really try to focus on modern approaches. And virtual memory works because of the same reasons that caches work in general, which is the principle of locality. So temporal locality and spatial locality. So a program is likely to access the code and data that is nearby in time and space. So a program we know is a sequence of instructions and data. That program is a file. It's actually been compiled to use virtual addresses. When you look at the disassembly of a program, if you've ever done that, and you see all the different addresses of the instructions of the program, those are actually virtual addresses. Actually, they're offsets from the start of the program as a virtual address, which means that when the operating system loads the program into physical memory and places it somewhere, then all of those offsets are essentially added to the base address of where the program wound up in memory. That's still grossly simplifying things, but that's the basic idea. So we're going to talk about page-based virtual memory. That's the dominant approach to how virtual memory systems are implemented these days. There are still some remnants of older virtual memory technology, specifically segmentation in the x86 processor family. The idea about paging is that it's a, a way to solve the problem of how to translate virtual addresses to physical addresses. Remember back to when we were talking about cache and we introduced the idea of cache and how caches hold blocks of data, a multiple of the word size. So a page is really a block in virtual memory, and it's gonna be much larger than a cache block. Virtual addresses may be mapped or translate to either physical addresses of the main memory or disk addresses for accessing the secondary storage. And the operating system is in charge of creating and managing those maps between virtual addresses to where the data are located. I don't plan to go into too much detail about the operating system side of things. We'll focus on what the hardware does, which is to actually translate virtual to physical addresses. So here is an image, a conceptual image of a process or a conceptual image of memory, really. So a process in memory. The operating system maintains this program mapping of the different sections of a program. So if you look from the bottom to top, we've got the text section. That's the instructions of the program. We've got some initialized data, the data section. The BSS is also some data section. The heap is dynamically allocated data. There's some regions for the operating system to link in shared libraries. So so that multiple programs can access the same code. Multiple processes can access the same libraries at runtime. You only need one of them physically in the system. And then the stack. For each process, the operating system is going to keep track of where these different sections are located. For example, two processes. Each process has its own virtual address space, and physical memory has a physical address space. And what we do is we partition both virtual address spaces and physical address spaces into these equal sized chunks. Just like we talked about partitioning memory and cache into equal sized blocks. So we're gonna partition main memory and virtual address space into equal sized chunks and we call those pages. Partition virtual address space into virtual pages, physical address space into physical pages. Sometimes I may refer to physical pages as frames or physical frames and virtual pages as maybe just pages is just terminology. Every program starts on disk because that's where a program lives. You compile a program and it becomes a binary executable and that is a file that lives on a disk. When the operating system loads that program into memory, it sets up some mappings between pages of the virtual address space of the program and physical pages in memory. And it copies those virtual pages from disk into memory. Here's an example on the top. We've got program one, and it's showing six pages. So there's six pages of the program on the disk. Only three of those pages have actually been allocated and mapped to physical memory location. The other three pages of that program, although they are valid virtual addresses, those pages exist on the disk. And so the program can't actually access those at this point in time because those pages aren't in physical memory. That's what loading does. As a program executes, some of its pages can be brought into physical memory. So that's called paging in from the disk. That happens 
for example, if the second page of this program, looking top to bottom, second page, gets accessed by the program, then the operating system is going to allocate a new physical page for that and copy it from the disk into the physical page and then allow the program to proceed with its access. That action of allocating a page and copying it from disk to memory is called a page fault. Page fault is not, strictly speaking, a bad thing, although it does imply quite a high performance penalty. And if there's no free available physical pages remaining, then the operating system has to decide which physical page to replace. So just like we talked about cache replacement policies, there are page replacement algorithms that are implemented in the operating system and software. And that's also beyond the scope of this conversation. So then we've got program two, which has five pages, and three of those are also mapped into physical memory so that the two processes can execute concurrently or even in parallel on a multi-core processor and be able to access physical memory to the pages that have been mapped to their virtual address space. That's conceptually how paging works. Let's continue to refine this and get some more detail. An address is a virtual address. That's what programs use. That's what processors use, virtual addresses. And we're going to translate virtual addresses to physical addresses. The physical address is going to be pretty much like what we've talked about already, a, a byte offset from the start of physical memory. A virtual address no longer has that meaning because of the way that we translate and map virtual to physical. Here we have a 32-bit virtual address. And the least significant 12 bits, bits 0 through 11, are what's called the page offset. And then the most significant remaining bits are the virtual page number. The virtual page offset is the same as the physical page offset. The reason for this is the page offset is the location of the specific byte within the page that is requested. So the translation, the mapping of page-sized chunks means that a virtual page and a physical page have the same size. And therefore, once you know where the physical page is located, the least significant bits, the page offset in the virtual address, are the same as the least significant bits that overlap in the physical address. That's because the virtual and physical pages are the same size. This may be a little bit tricky concept to grasp onto, so maybe just take it as a fact for now. We may be able to discuss it later. Meanwhile, translation of a virtual page number to a physical page number may change the size of the address. Now, this depends on the relationship between the virtual address space size and the physical address space size. So in this example, we have a 30-bit physical address, which means that the physical address space is a 30-bit address space that's 2 to the 30th bytes. So that's 1 gigabyte. The virtual address space having 32 bits, a 32-bit virtual address space, 2 to the 32nd, which is 2 to the second times 2 to the 30th. So that's 4 gigabytes. So a 4 gigabyte virtual address space mapping down to a one gigabyte physical address space. So this is what you would see if you have a 32-bit machine with uh, one gigabyte lugged into its RAM socket. It, it looks complicated, but we'll break it down. We'll start from left to right. We still have the virtual address up on the very top there, virtual page number with the page offset, and then physical page number with the page offset. And we'll look at how an address translation happens by example. On the left, we have the page table base register. This is a special purpose register that a processor needs to have somewhere between the processor pipeline and the physical memory. Typically, this is going to be integrated with the back end of a cache controller or the memory controller, not too close to the processor pipeline itself. So the page table base register points to the physical address of the start of a page table. So it's how the hardware can find a page table. This example is what's called a one-level page table. It's essentially an array of physical page numbers that are indexed by the virtual page number. Uh, and we'll talk about maybe one or two other approaches to page table organization. This is the oldest and simplest paging mechanism. The virtual page number index, the page table array, the page table entries consist of the physical page number and some additional metadata. At a minimum, there will be a valid bit. Typically, there's going to be several other metadata bits within the page table entry. The, the metadata bits are usually stored in the least significant bits overlapping with the offset because those are unused bits in terms of when you look at the physical address. This virtual page number is used to index a page table. And then from that, you get the physical page number. 
and the offset comes down from the virtual page address right in the physical address to the physical page number taken from the page table and the offset taken from the virtual address. And you can use that to access the location in main memory where that byte or word or whatever. Actually, this is usually going to be a cache block. So where that cache block is located, you want to fetch into the cache. And you can see that page table entries that are invalid, they may be on disk, in which case the operating system needs to know where to find them on disk. And usually the page table entry is going to store some hint to help the operating system find that. There can also be just completely invalid valid addresses, which means that the, the virtual page does not exist on disk. That is what leads to a segmentation fault when a process tries to access a virtual address that does not belong to it at all. So that is one level page table. Let's now talk about the impacts of address translation on memory access. The translation requires going to memory to read the page table entry. If we send a virtual address out and we have to translate it to a physical address before we access the cache, then we would have to go to memory every time we have a cache access. This would make memory accesses really, really expensive if we actually had to do this. We don't. This organization of translating a virtual address to a physical address before the cache is done, and we'll talk about how it's done. It's not always done, but it can be done. And this is called a physically addressed cache, usually calling it a physically indexed, physically tagged, meaning that we index the cache using the physical address and we check the tag using the physical address. So the cache stores the tag bits of the physical address. And we're going to talk about some pros and cons of that. So why don't we use the virtual address to access the cache? That's a good question. You can do that. This is a scheme called virtually indexed, virtually tagged. But it leads to several complications. And I think we have at least some of them here to describe. If we do that, then we can do the physical address translation in parallel with the cache access. Uh, which would help us to hide that translation cost, right? If we get a cache hit, then we wouldn't care about the address translation. If we get a cache miss, we'd have to wait for our address translation to finish before we fill in that cache. One of the problems is that two programs that share memory could have two different virtual addresses for that physical location, in which case there could be an alias of data in the cache where you have two locations in the cache, caching the same physical address, but are at two different locations because the virtual addresses have different indices, different tags. And this can cause inconsistencies between the two copies. You could have one program get a cache right hit on their shared block, update that block, and then the other program could get a cache read hit on its block and not see that update at a high level is aliasing. This can be solved, but in order to do that, you have to have some additional mechanisms to ensure physical addresses can be accessed through these aliases. Here is a, an example showing what can happen with two programs that share a variable somewhere in memory, program one and program two, and they both load the address and program one, process one, stores a value to that address and process two reads a value from that address. So if it's a virtually addressed cache, the index of these two locations, and you'll note that in process one, the address is at a different virtual page than in process two. Uh, if we number the pages top to bottom, then in process one, that would be page number four in process two. That would be page number two if we start counting from zero. Virtually addressed cache, therefore, you would have a cache of process one's access on the top and a cache of process two's access there in blue on the bottom. And this could lead to multiple different results based on the order in which the processes execute. If initially the cache holds the value of Z for both processes, then if process one goes first, it'll write zero into its cache line. And then process two will read Z, which is not the right thing to do. If process two goes first, it reads Z. And then process one goes, it can write zero. That at least you can understand what that means from a sort of a logical notion of time. This is, in a nutshell, the cache coherence problem, which is how do we make sure that we store 
values in multiple locations of the cache that correspond with the same physical location in a way that ensures the most recent read sees the most recent write. That is a very simplified statement of cache coherence. We are going to revisit this cache coherence problem in quite more depth later in this course when we get to talking about multiprocessing. Aliasing is a case of this cache incoherence that can occur when you have virtual addressing. You can solve it, like I said, but it is expensive. This third option here on the bottom, overlaying the page offset with the virtual index so that the index is part of the page offset and therefore part of the physical address. We are going to look at that in much more detail because that is really how most processors actually deal with this problem. So here it is overlaying the index with the page offset. If the cache index bits, the, the bits of the address that we use to index the cache overlap with the page offset, then what that means is that those index bits are the same in the virtual address as they are in the physical address because of this, this direct translation of the page offset to page offset. So as a result, that means that the virtual address index is in fact a physical index. Since it's a physical index, the virtual addresses that map to the same physical location will index to the same set in the cache. Now we can still have a problem if we have a set associative cache because their tags are going to be different, but we can simplify the problem greatly by reducing the possibility of aliasing to just being within the same set. And furthermore, if we use a direct mapped cache, then we can completely get rid of aliasing by this mechanism since there's only one cache entry in the direct mapped set we can no longer have incoherent reads and writes however because these two virtual addresses that share the same physical location but different virtual addresses have different tags we would not get hits from accessing the same location we would get misses so it would be correct it would just be less efficient than if we didn't have aliasing at all this, this is a crash course introduction to aliasing There's another problem, homonyms, words that sound alike but are different. Here we have two different variables, variable one, variable two, and they're at two different physical address locations, but they have the same virtual address. So two processes with different data at the same virtual address. The data are different, and so the mapping from the virtual pages to physical pages is different. So the two variables are not shared data. They exist at different locations of the physical memory. If we use the virtual tag, we get a hit here in two different processes. That, that would be very bad. Bad. That's actually a much harder problem to solve in some ways. If we have virtual tags, then we would have to flush caches whenever there's a process switch between two processes. That could work for private caches. That can't work when you have multiple cores that share a cache. Since you have multiple processes executing simultaneously, there's no way to, to flush the cache in between them. You can add these address space identifiers, these tags, they're called, it's called a tagged cache. I don't know why tag. Uh, so these ACID tags to each block in the cache in order to distinguish different processes. This is a nice idea, but it has a pretty high space overhead, and so it's not really done for caches. It's been done in some limited contexts, but not in caches. Or you can use physical tags, and, and that's really what you end up having to do. And you can do physical addressing with a cache. So let's take a look at the physical addressing problem where we said, okay, well, it takes you two memory accesses to translate. What we can do is we can introduce a cache of the translations. Instead of looking up the page table when we do a translation, we can look in a cache of the page table. So we've got this piece of hardware called a translation look aside buffer, cache of translations. The TLB is a small cache of the virtual to physical translations that have been made recently in a program. Now we have a TLB cache access, which is usually a smaller cache, so it's relatively less costly than a processor cache access. When the TLB misses, then we have to do the page table based translation, and that takes a lot longer time. So how the TLB works, 
here we've got our picture of address translation using a one-level page table. We have a TLB. We first send our virtual page number into the cache, and we search the tags of the cache for the virtual page number. This is here, this is assuming a fully associative TLB, which is a pretty common implementation, which means you search all of the tags in parallel for the entire virtual page number. If you have a set associative or a direct mapped TLB, then you would use the least significant bits of the page number to index the TLB, uh, most significant bits of the virtual page number for the tag match of the TLB. Now that virtual page number tag will then give you the data stored in the cache, which are the physical page numbers. The physical page base address or the physical page number can come out of the TLB and gives you the base address and then you add that to the page offset, which comes out of the virtual address, and you've got your physical address without having to go to memory to do the translation because the TLB is in hardware. And each time that we do the page table access, we keep a copy of what we found from that page table translation in the TLB. When you have a TLB miss, you have to determine if there's a translation, then you get the translation. That's just a TLB miss. If the page is not resident in physical memory, then it's a page fault. Uh, if the page exists in physical memory, then the TLB miss can be handled by walking the page table to find the translation, accessing the page table in main memory, uh, and this takes tens, hundreds of cycles since you have to access main memory to get the translation. If it's a one-level page table, right, it's one memory access. If the page is not physically resident in main memory, meaning it's a disk, then it's a page fault, and this takes millions of processor cycles to rectify. TLB misses are very frequent. Page faults are less frequent. This table shows some of the possible and not possible combinations of TLB hits, page table hits and misses, a miss in the page table is a page fault, and cache hits and misses. Of course, they can all hit. That's what we want. TLB can hit, page table can hit, the cache can miss. This can happen if a cache block got replaced, although we don't actually hit, we don't actually check the page table when we get a hit in the TLB. Assume the TLB hits, then the page table would hit. The TLB misses, the page table can hit, the cache can hit, yes, uh, although you first have to get the physical address out of the page table in order to verify that it was a hit since you have to do the physical tag match of the cache. You can miss in the TLB and miss in the cache and hit in the page table. This is pretty typical when you have a page that hasn't been accessed recently, but was accessed at some point in the past. So the, the TLB entry and the cache entries got evicted. You can have all three miss. That's a typical page fault. You cannot have a hit in the TLB and have a miss in the page table. If a page is not physically resident in main memory, doesn't have a valid entry in the page table, it had better not have a valid entry in the TLB. If it does, then bad things have happened. It is also not possible to have a cache hit for a page that is not physically resident in main memory. When the TLB misses, this can be handled in hardware or software. Modern processors typically will deal with this in software. Older processors, including x86, implemented the TLB mishandling in hardware, although operating systems often disabled that capability in order to have more control over how TLB misses are dealt with. What happens in a TLB miss is that the TLB mishandling has to determine if there is a translation of the requested virtual page in the page table. TLB miss has to be determined before the memory access actually proceeds. So if you think about your fetch decode execute memory right back machine, you've got to interrupt the execution of the instruction that caused that TLB miss before it can update any of the state of the processor. So in our five stage pipeline, that means we've got to stop that instruction before it can finish them. If it has an ITLB miss, we catch that during the decode stage, because if we don't, we may be getting some kind of garbage coming through our pipeline. We talk about what exceptions are. Maybe I'll revisit that again. The TLB mishandler has to find the translation and copy the physical page number from the page table in memory to the TLB. This is called installing the entry. And then it should restart the faulting instruction. Whatever instruction caused the TLB miss needs to be fetched again. If that page table entry translation does not exist in the page table, or rather if it's invalid in the page table, then there's a page 
page fault, and this is always an exception that's raised to the operating system, and the operating system has to deal with it. Page fault handler briefly uses the virtual address to find the page table entry in the page table, and then from information stored in the page table, typically it will locate the page on secondary storage, and it may choose a physical page to replace. And if that physical page has been modified, then it has to write that physical page out to disk before it can start overwriting it, just like a write back cache has to write out a dirty block before replacing it. The operating system has to write out a dirty page before replacing it. And then read the physical page from disk into memory and add the translation to the page table and then restart, resume executing that process. We'll restart execution from the faulting instruction. This is all the responsibility of the operating system. Finally, when we have the virtually indexed, physically tagged cache organization, we can do the cache access in parallel to the address translation, the TLB lookup. And so the way this works is that you send the virtual page number to the TLB and you send the index to the cache. If it's a set associative cache, the index is going to give you several blocks back and you send the tag that you get from the TLB to the comparisons with the blocks coming out of the cache, and really whether they're set associative or direct mapped. So you, you do this in a multiple step process. The TLB miss, it's, it's going to raise an exception and, and abort this uh, cache access anyway. The right hand side is pretty much the typical two-way set associative cache access where instead of taking the tag from the address, we're taking the tag coming out of the TLB. The, the, the physical address tag, by the way, which is not the same thing as the TLB tag, right? The TLB tag is actually the virtual address tag portion of the virtual address. That's really all I want to say about that. These are really the two predominant ways of organizing address translations with respect to caches, either using a physically addressed cache or using uh, splitting it into a virtually indexed physically tag where it's virtually indexed because the virtual index is actually a physical index. So it's a little bit of a black magic trickery. Parts of this are done by the hardware, parts are done by the software. The TLB is a hardware mechanism. The page table walk, so actually doing a TLB miss, like I said, that can be done by the hardware if the page table is relatively simple. And increasingly, it's done by the software, however, by the operating system. And then page faults have always been the responsibility of the operating system because it is rather complex to implement. So we've talked about locality and we've talked about different kinds of caches. Now we've introduced several more kinds of caches. TLB is a kind of cache. Physical memory is a kind of cache. Physical memory is a cache for the disk. TLB is a cache for the page table. All the caches deal with these four important questions. Where can you find entries of the cache? Um, or where are they placed? Where can you find them? How do you find them? How do you replace them? And how do you deal with updates of uh, cached entries? That is the end of that bulldozer-like discussion.